Excellent. So uh, my name is Chris Young, uh, at Netman Chris on the Twitter, and I am a technical marketing engineer in HP. Is looking for the camera. We'll go with that one. Um, HP's technical marketing organization. So that's uh, me in a nutshell. Jacob. Yeah, my name is Jacob Rapp. I'm, uh, I lead up the SDN marketing uh, in, HP in HP networking. Uh, Brent Salisbury, uh, blog at Network Static and on Twitter at Network Static. I'm Chris Margett. I'm an independent network consultant and on the Twitter I'm at Chris Margett. I am Jason Edelman. My blog is jedelman.com and on Twitter at jedelman8. Yeah, so um, I mean, just to recap kind of what we've been announcing and talking about for uh, the past few weeks, back at Interop, we announced a, um, a whole ecosystem around software defined networking and uh, really trying to, uh, I mean, gain momentum in, in the application space. So, I mean, if you look at software defined networking, it's been really a technology, right? Whether it's SDN with OpenFlow, or you have the overlays, network virtualization, or you have NFV. These are all technologies, but what's their actual solution that it's trying to solve? So we're trying to take that next step into the solution area, where it's the app business applications that are really driving, uh, I think, SDN in the future. So we announced our SDN SDK, which is just our a, a really good toolkit um, to develop on, and really a platform to develop on, where we provide really all the tools that are needed um, along with the controller, which you can install as a VM, uh, and you can simulate networks with like Mininet from uh, um, uh, created by like Stanford and the One Labs and that team. And uh, you can also we also put a lot of funding in a virtual lab, so we put a bunch of HP gear in there, so developers can go test out their applications. Once they start, once they develop an application, they can go test it out, and it really enables a couple guys in the garage to go innovate now. Because before you had like if you if you wanted to go innovate within networking, you had to probably buy millions of dollars worth of gear to go simulate the networks and and um, and build them out. So and then actually develop your application and probably be a pretty close partner to HP or, or one of our competitors to really figure out what you need to do and how you need to integrate. So we're trying to open this thing up a bit, bring the developers together, and then also provide the ecosystem. So we announced an app store and uh, that we're going to go to market with uh, in the second half, or the first half of 2014. So the controller, the SDK, within a week or two from now, in early November, we're going to have uh, that available uh, for download and. Uh, then we'll get the apps running, going, and get it out into the into the uh, into the market. What is the SDK? Is it you know, so? Is this a SDK that would communicate with the controller above the controller, communicate with the network devices below that? And is there certain languages supported through the SDK today? What does that model look like? Yeah, I mean, the SDK is what we're really calling a, the SDN developer kit, which is, I mean, software is inherent in that. Um, this is just a set of tools, right? So we have the API guides, uh, which we have a RESTful API uh, for the majority of the functions uh, that you can do. Then we have an internal Java API uh, that you can program to if you want to really do close network integrated uh, type internal applications. Internal Java meaning internal to the controller or to Yeah, it's really, HP. It, no, it's, it's, not, it's an open Open API, okay. so everyone can use the, the internal API or the so it's internal to the controller. It's a it's a more native type API than a RESTful API is. So we have like kind of both both sets that we can go go develop on, and uh, along with along with the APIs itself, it's just the developer tools, right? So the um, I mean technically, if we just give the APIs out there, you can anyone can develop on them. Sure. They don't need anything else for it. But we wanted to make go kind of above that where we provide the. Uh, um, bunch of documentation, developers' guides, uh, the simulation suite, the validation suite. Because we want, I mean, this is enter we want to make it enterprise great. So is there virtual switches and routers in this kit to be able to program against? Yeah. So I mean, I think that's what we're we're leveraging uh, Mininet from those originally come came from Stanford and One Labs, uh, where it's you can basically simulate virtual networks and in, in, in using that. I mean, since we our developers use that to to, to ourselves to when we test our own applications on it, uh, we just put out a guide on how to use that and then point to like to where to go download that. But then we went one step further and created that virtual lab where it's free for developers to go access. It's like a reservation system where they can just go reserve the gear, go test their application. We'll have a validation suite that like goes and validates um, anything anywhere from the code 
just like checking if there's not not making any stupid errors or security problems or anything like that that's going to go blow up the controller, and then go validate it on with some common use cases and topologies from there. So it's a remote hosted many lots of many net instances that anybody with an HP account can sign up for and get access to. No, it's actual gear. Okay. So anyone could go download MiniNet. It's an open oh, source so project. You're you've got gear. So, but then yeah, the virtual lab is actually virtual is probably not the, the best term yes, for it because hardware. it's it's actual hardware that we oh, bought. Very cool. So they can simulate actual yeah. actual gear without having to go buy it. So do you expose a controller interface GUI or are you just exposing APIs or? It's both. I mean, the controller has a GUI. Mm -hmm. Inherent in it, and actually the app store is embedded in that GUI itself. There's a couple models where you can download apps. One, one being directly on the controller, as kind of a direct install of your app from that, or or you can do it remotely and kind of push kind of push model a direct install to the to multiple controllers. So it's kind of educate. So it's an opportunity for community to kind of educate themselves on SDN. Yeah, educate, and then for our partners to go to start developing apps, and we we, we announced an ecosystem of around 20 plus partners uh, that are actively working within the ecosystem uh, in various stages of development, um, and you'll see us starting to roll out those applications as as the months go by, and as we as our partners uh, reach their point where their de the development is done, and all of these we're jointly developing with with our partners. And I think that's one thing we wanted to drill down into in this session, uh, what Chris is going to go after, is that we wanted to go f drill down into what is an app. Because last time we talked a lot about, okay, here's the ecosystem, here's this great partnership, but in the end it's, it's the app. So we wanted to drill down on what the apps do, how they work, how they integrate, how are they actually, how's the flow of traffic actually happening, and what tables are touched, and what, and how does this thing scale and, and, and work. So that's what we wanted to drill down into in this session, is one actually show look at something. One more question, if you're going to whiteboard that, you know, that's great. In terms of an app store, you know, it could, in an ideal world, you might have lots of applications to choose from. And uh, you know, multiple apps on the same controller platform. If some are built on REST, some are built with native Java APIs. On what sort of you know, are there issues and concerns on having multiple applications potentially doing similar things? Or you know, could there be a way a common database model, or you know, one application overwriting another application's data? You know, just sort of you know, is there you know, what the methodology and approaches to you know, mitigate some of that risk? I think that in general, that's that's some of the stuff as we're going on. And again, um, if you look, and then we did do this. Um, we, we had a more in-depth discussion at the last tech field day. So this is actually not even what we wanted to talk to you guys about. But this is awesome stuff. Um, um, so that this is where we'll, we'll put that link back in. Um, but the approach, general approach to market that we're looking at right now is um, recommendations for our customers. For instance, is this this SDK, this virtual environment, is a chance to get your toes in the pool. There's a lot of questions in these environments, operationally speaking, that I think we don't know yet. So I think if I'm, if I can rephrase your question, is there an arbiter involved? How do you, sure. when you have different applications, requesting levels of services that actually conflict? How does that work out? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I have an answer for that question. Yet. Okay, nobody does. Yeah, no, I know. I'm like, I'm not. A, a read write northbound is uh, a problem. Also, and I guess you say ecosystem, but we're really talking about kind of platforms that we're not even sure what they're going to be, right? I mean, so we're still in platform wars, so my concern is... We are. But where does, does it, don't we have to have a platform that's somewhat common across the board before we start getting into apps, and before people put R&D into apps? We can all agree that the market's totally fragmented right now, right? So part of what we're doing is trying to put the HP name and the HP brand and that, that behind it and actually bring a solution to market that is a complete ecosystem. It's not just a controller or just a switch that supports OpenFlow or, or some other API or, or whatever. It's, it's a complete total solution where we actually are looking at the app store part portion of it. So um, trying to control how apps come into the store. Because again, if your phone blows up, it's kind of a different model than, than what Apple or Android has done, right? So we're trying to do some more um, some more testing on the apps to make sure that when you put this in your enterprise network, if it is a complete tested app, you've got some degree of stability. And we're, we're trying to take a little bit of that risk out of just, which in a lot of senses today, if you're developing, just taking something from an open source, some random guy, there are projects that are very well managed. And there's other ones that might not be so much. Some guy in a garage that releases something that seems to do what you said it's going to do and blows things up. Right? It's just, that's kind of the jailbreak.
I, is, is the app model the kind of thing where that we would load a bunch of apps to inter interact with the controller at once, and each one is a point solution for for some small problem? Um, again, I don't think we're 100 percent there yet as far as figuring out what what does an SDN architecture even look like, right? Um, what, what we're looking at is probably you're going to have discrete SDN domains where you have different controllers and different architectural blocks of the network. So you're probably going to have your campus-based apps having your campus. You know, there's there's this the, the marketing idea that you see sometimes of you know one omniscient controller globally controlling everything in the entire world, which I think we can all agree is not ever going to happen. Yeah, it's <laughs> uh, sorry, you know, physics, speed of light, stuff, latency that kind of gets in the way. Right. But even then, like you know, just within one part of the network, within the you know the campus or within a you know within a, an access layer type building, is there one uh, controller app driving that building, or is it one of them that you know? You, I think there's going to be there's going to marks be. voice traffic and another one that you know you're that kind of thing. Going to have uh, a a controller, and I'll call it controller domain. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, HA, you're going to have multiple controllers in some kind of HA relationship, looking after probably a discrete architectural block. And you're going to have multiple apps loaded on that controller at that point, right? So it's not going to be app to controller in a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay, that, that's what I was getting at. That yeah. would mean, or operationally, that would be simple. Well, I'd have to find exactly the right app with exactly the right features, unless you know it's yeah. the kind of thing where it can be compartmentalized and I can load all of the different features that I want. Yeah. Well, when we think about it, it's like it's this whole discussion of being like application aware or application directed in, in the network, where it's, I mean. I think we've tried to be application aware in some certain senses, but it requires a lot of hardware. And like you can only know a flow based off of a certain context, and you can infer that this thing means it's some type of traffic, and I try to optimize on it. But if I go directly to the source of that traffic, which is the application, and let the application interface now with the SDN controller, then I can do real time on on the spot optimizations, and that's what we're going to dive into. Of like, so look if all the apps that you are running, you have the potential to have a hook into the network. Whether it makes sense, some of them may not want to. Some sure. of them may require it. So I think it, it's going to be based on the applications that are running in, in, in the business. That are, and then probably there's going to be some troubleshooting ones, some orchestration ones, those types of things that are actually native applications that involve the network, but there's going to that day-to-day -day operations of the network anyway. And that, that's a great job off point for me to go over there. So what we want to talk to you about today is something that we actually showed at Ethernet Summit, I think is the first place we showed this, which was a API level integration of um, Microsoft Link to our controller. And so I don't know if you guys have seen this a little bit before. But this is an approach, and again, one of the things that we've done as HP is a little bit different than what's going on in the marketplace is there tends to be the, the Google love that gets shown to SDN. Everybody's talking about SDN in the data center. And we have, we think we've shown some pretty compelling applications on SDN and campus. Right, which is working on, on sometimes current hardware that we're selling right now, sometimes hardware that's been selling for five or six years in the marketplace, right? So we have all our, our approach and legacy that we that has. And that's a really good point though, because HP has had generally available open flow, SDN enabled hardware for how many years? Since 2008 at Genie, right? On its first demo? Yeah. It's, I mean, there's, 30, there's at least 30 products. Yes. Yeah, we have over 25 million ports we've shipped out in the market. So it's like it's this is where it's the use cases are coming in now. Yeah. It was 1.0. 1.3 is actually available and it should be posted on the website. Like could be now kind of thing. 1.3 on those products as well. No, so, it. Good. Yeah, no, and, and yeah, it's just free lifetime warranty, all that good stuff, right? So um, I'm an old voice guy, right? So. Um, if you look at the way that we've done things from a QoS standpoint, right? QoS marking, if you really look at it from a networking standpoint, um, you're really kind of doing you have a couple of choices. You can do an NBAR, right? Or um, so the NBAR Cisco, which is DAR, same thing on an HP standpoint, you can do network based recognition of the protocol. And then you can try to do marking there. You can trust whatever your users are putting into the network and, and hope that they're trustworthy. Right? Or you've got some marking mechanisms which you can take like a 16,000 port range from a UDP and kind of look for some relationship. Like The truth is we're guessing. Like, like Jacob said, we're guessing that based on it looks like this, therefore it's probably XYZ. Right? So one of the things that we did, which is a little different, um, is we actually put an, an API level integration between Microsoft Link and our controller. Right? So what ends up happening is as a call control call comes in, I have a phone that says, hey, you know, I've got this centralized SIP proxy, call management, whatever. That call manager here at this point, or link, actually has knowledge of the state of both of those devices. 
right? So I know what the call stream is going to be, I know what the IP address is of both of those devices, and so it's going to then communicate to the controller, and it's going to go over and actually push the flow down to that device, and it's going to say, this particular call that's happening here, I'm going to mark that with XYZ, whatever DSCP value, whatever, you know, whatever marking mechanism I choose to do at that point in time. So what's really interesting and different about this is this is actually application that I'm now going to have the capability to say this particular phone call. And if you extend that out to where this logically could go, it's mahogany row, all the executives, they're going to hit a different level of service. You know, what happens if I've got video? What happens if I've got other voice? I've got Skype, I've got all these other things that based on our network policies, the legacy way of doing this, you know, you could be giving priority to people who are doing total non-business critical things. You know, it also gives the ability to do things like what happens if I've got the State of the Union address, you know, for your internal CEO, and that's going to be this streaming application at this point in time. If that's video coming through Link at that point in time, I can now say that this particular call in this three-hour window gets preference over top of everything else. So this is this is again, um, you know, this is this really wonderful idea. Of the application is going to request a level of service from the network, and the network can then respond or not, right? Those rules you program in, then it's it's not uh, a DSCP marking policy. It's it's a flow forwarding policy. Not really, right? So this is uh, originally we did do a service path. So if I've got more more devices down here, right, and I've got a phone down here, there's marking on the edge, right? I could do all of this the whole way through. The presumption there is that you've got a complete SDN network end to end. Is that a safe presumption nowadays? Do you know anybody who's going to do a complete campus SDN network today, end to end? It's probably not going to happen, right? So we've taken a different approach. And the other nice thing about this is it's a slightly slightly different approach from the hybrid that, that we use at HP um, is we have certain rule sets, one or two flows, that I'm going to, based on this matching criteria, I'm going to pump back to the controller, and I'm going to take a decision based on, on whatever that condition is. And anything else, I just have a catch-all sent to normal switch logic. Okay, so right. table this is normal. Yep, so this is the other great thing about this is, um, you know, look at some of the, the critiques of, you know, flow table sizes. Oh, it's beautiful. Right? You don't have yeah. to worry about it, it's a campus environment. Obviously. You've got 48 points, you've got 48 <laughs> flow rules. Right? Pretty, so, I mean, in classification and ingestion yeah. at the edge is 90% of everything in the campus. Mark at the edge, right? That's I mean, exactly right. That's what we're doing yep. today at our university. Yep. A thousand ports, exactly that. Yep. So, so, so you can take that to firewall and you can take that to anything you can do between L2 and L4. So we've, so far we've done this on a Sentinel application as well, which is doing DNS and then DNS blocking. So instead of having the IBS policy or a centralized firewall, you can actually push that from a policy standpoint to the edge of the network. And if you've got something like leveraging our taking point reputation DB, we can take that IP intellectual property and just say, you know, if you're going to these known IP address segments from a DNS standpoint, just drop it before it hits your security devices, right? So, so, so right now, is it possible to leverage this application plus Sentinel simultaneously? Yes. Yep. Yep, yep totally different. Uh, the flow rules are completely non conflicting. One's doing DNS, one is, mm -hmm. one is actually marking um, the flow travels. Right, just marking blocks. And as far as this goes, so right now going back to you know some of the conversation, you know, are you just modifying to the TOS so the class of service bits yep. when this happens? Well, so there's no other you know markings or changing flow that's happening. No, so yeah, we mark right now because again the, the thought process. So um, we're presuming that up is we're presuming that the rest of the QoS quality service policies right. throughout the network haven't put in place properly. So then this action is to modify those bits, then forward as normal. Yes. Okay. And so it's a remark, push it through, mark it based on business logic rather than some, um, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, some guessing. And again, guessing is not bad if that's all you have, right? But if there's a better way to do it, which is what this starts to open up. And then what I personally really like about this is if you look at a lot of solutions that are out there right now and the things we're talking about, you know, and that's, um, you know, the conversations we're having at the hall of everything is data center focused. Yeah. Yeah. Data center represents the riskiest portion of my network. Right, that's where all my apps, that's where all my data, that's where everything that I really care about as a business lives. What I'm really excited about this, I've got 60, 70 customers that are, have been doing data trials with this stuff. It's a 24 port switch on the edge of your network. If you knock out 24 people, the risk level of 
figuring it out and, and gaining some of that operational knowledge of how SDN actually is going to work in real networks in the real world, it makes it a lot easier for customers to get their toes in the water because you don't have to worry about that. You know, from, from me as a data center guy, if I'm in charge of a data center, am I going to make a decision that's going to knock out, you know, go with an architecture that's un, unproven, un, you know, if I'm, if I'm the Googles, if I'm the, the, the non-typical, atypical cases where I've got thousands of programmers to throw at these things and a, and a completely isolated pinpoint precision use case, awesome. You can do that stuff. Well, I mean, regardless of data center, this is an enterprise focus that we're avoiding the market on it. Yep. Uh, I think it's definitely worth talking about the actual mechanism because it's really hard to screw this up. You put in a rule, that rule stays there. It doesn't, you know, th there's a hard time out of zero. If the controller goes away, that flow rule stays there. The only time the flow rule is going to come out of the switch is if the switch, you can pull the plug on it and it comes up, it's not persistent, or if somebody's in the flow line and pulls it. Yep. That's cool. No, it's nice because you don't need a you know pure fabric. Really, you were saying earlier, hey, you know, it went at the edge. Don't change anything. So yeah, you know, right now, I guess you know what's you know what's the downside, right? So when you when you go into hybrid mode to leverage the applications, you know, from you know Sentinel or with Link, you know, do you lose any functionality that's been already deployed with your traditional L2 L3 the, fabric? No. Then the biggest. I mean, one flow rule turns it into a L2 L3 switch. Constant about pipeline. Yeah. No, I view it as like dynamic PBR essentially to a certain extent. You know, with it's layering on an easier way to deploy PBR on the edges of the network and take those configs away, you know, pretty quickly. I think the only thing that I would say if I have to put on like my what what's the biggest problem with this is the presumption that quality of service is configured right, right, right. across your network, right? That's <laughs> yeah, I think in the end it's like a, it's a it's a journey that we're on. It's like we don't expect everyone to kind of have SDN everywhere right now. It's sure. like okay, what are the use cases, and we're actually tackling something with like our customers came to us with, and that are actually are deploying now. And that you can do today in a non-risk adverse environment. Like that's the beauty of get get your toes in the pool now. That's cool.